Peters that have been part of this congregation, Columbus, Georgia, wouldn't be Columbus, Georgia. I can tell you that right now. Amen. So we thank God for this church. We thank God for this church for the opportunity to be here today to celebrate with you. And it is so appropriate that our scripture for today's service is Jeremiah 29, 11. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. You know, this is such a popular phrase, such an inspirational phrase, that we see it on coffee mugs and t-shirts and bumper stickers. And it's, it's become so much of our, our popular culture that when you ask somebody uh, what it means to them, you kind of get the impression sometimes they think, well, if I'm going through something tough, God's going to benefit me when I get on the other side of it. You know, sort of like when you say you're going to go on a diet and you stay on it for a week, you're going to eat some pie on Sunday, right? You're going to give yourself a little, little bonus, a little gift. You're going to go through that first week and you're going to prosper yourself in the end, right? And so, and so you find people saying, using this, this part of the scripture, and, and saying things like, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm struggling, I'm going through this illness, but there is a purpose. When I get done, God's going to prosper me. He's going to prosper me. Maybe I'm going to get a better job out of it. Maybe, maybe I'm, maybe I'm going to boat. I'm going to boat. I've got to go through this trial and tribulation. I'm going to get something good on the other side of this. But they're missing the point. It's not exactly what God had in mind. It's not exactly what God had in mind. The context of this particular scripture was the Israelites had been exiled from Jerusalem for disobedience. They were in Babylon and they didn't like it much. They didn't like it much. They'd been enslaved. They wanted to go home. That's right. They wanted to go home. And so there were all these false prophets out there telling them what they wanted to hear. God said he has what he had promised. I'm going to deliver you home. The false prophet said, it's going to be about two years. Just hang out. We're going to be all right. We just hang out about two years. We're going to head on back home. Jeremiah comes and said, I got good news and I got bad news. He said, uh, we're going home all right. It's going to be about 70 years. And, and before God delivers us back home, we got to do a few things. He said, we've got, to, we've got to actually work with the Babylonians to prosper their community. We've got to pray. For our combined prosperity. What? They've enslaved us. They disrespected us. We've been exiled. We're without a home. And we gotta pray for these folks. We gotta create a community with people who aren't like us. That's God's plan for us. It turns out, indeed it was. And that the you, God had in mind when he said, I have plans to prosper you, were the community. It was us. All of us. He had plans to prosper the community and the you within it. And so when we go through these difficult times, and we're looking for a little help, a little hope, a little promise. There's going to be help and promise. It might not be a boat. It might not be a piece of pie. It's going to be something else. Something else much more meaningful. What we need to remember is that we are vessels of God's plan. These aren't the plans that we necessarily have for ourselves. But God's plan and how he wants these plans furthered. This passage is about us. About me, not about you. It's about us and our combined role in this epic, long-term plan of God's to benefit and prosper His people. Nothing about what enriches us personally, but what enriches us as part of a community, as part of a humanity improvement 
journey. It's about the joy of connectedness. It's about the benefit of community. And we prosper through this service to others, through this praying for peace, even with that Babylonian, praying for peace, praying that we jointly prosper. And through that, we prosper too. And other opportunities open to us that we didn't even think was possible. Amen. Don't you find that we are speaking with young people today and about 30 seconds into the conversation of what they want to do with their lives, they pretty much tell you that all they want to do is be rich and be famous. <laughs> right? When I grow up, I want to be rich and I want to be famous. Try having a conversation with the young folks telling them, and I'll tell these folks right here, honey, the secret to life is peace of mind. It's peace of mind. It's the comfort and the ease and the joy that comes with being connected with other people. Of experiencing love and no amount of money, no amount of fame can put salve on emptiness. It can put salve on loneliness. And so your richness in life comes from being connected. That's the gift. That's the prosperity. Being connected, having peace of mind with where you are and who you are in this community. You know, we don't always know what is the plan for us or what the plan for us should be. It evolves over time. We have ideas we think we know best, right? And, and, you know, I remember, of course, being a young person thinking what I wanted to do, and it, none of that turned out, by the way. <laughs> but I have the opportunity to speak with young people all the time about what they want to do, and in fact, when I get done being mayor, one of the things I'm going to do is write a book on the things kids, kids say. Because you wouldn't believe it. As a matter of fact, I was at the Omega dinner last night, and had a little girl sitting next to me, her name was Sadie. She was three. And she came in and she's looking good. I mean, she had on this dress. It was, she was looking good. And she had her hair up. She had these little, little bobbles in her hair. She had on these shoes. They had silver glitter, lacquered Mary Janes. She's looking good. About the end of the dinner, though, Sadie's getting a little restless, a little tired. Sadie didn't go home. And so I thought we only had a few more minutes if I could just maybe maybe I could get her attention if my, my help us get through the last 15 minutes of the program. So I leaned over to Sadie and I said, I sure do like those shoes. She said, thank you. And I said, those are some beautiful, shiny silver shoes. She said, thank you. <laughs> and I said, I could use those shoes. You, you think they have those shoes in my size? She gave me one look up and down. She said, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> at the pity of a three-year-old, she took one look at me and said, that woman didn't have one shiny thing on. <laughs> that woman needs some shiny shoes. <laughs> but, but my very favorite story, and I tell it all the time because it's just precious, and it happens to fit in with the scripture here today, was one time I was going to the Springer Opera House, they have a summer camp, and, and uh, I was going to speak to some four- and five-year-olds over there, and, and so we got there, and of course we were doing sprinkler, you know, having a big time, and, uh, and, and so at the end they said, well, does anybody have any questions, want to ask the mayor some questions about being mayor, and so one little girl, you know, raised her hand, and, and she said, um, Mayor, what did you want to be when you were my age? And I said, well, when I was your age, I wanted to be a ballerina. And she said, well, what were you before you were mayor? And I said, well, I was a lawyer. She said, oh, no, your dreams didn't come true. <laughs> no, sweetie, my, my dreams didn't come true of being a ballerina, but God's dreams came true. Whether I knew it or not, you know, a lot of times young people ask me, they'll say, 
Um, when did you know you were a leader? You know, now they teach leadership, if you don't know this. It's actually something they take in high school and they take in college, thank goodness. But, so they have classes on leadership now. You don't have to kind of feel your way. They, they, they tell you a little bit about it these days. And so, you know, one of the questions I get is, um, well, when did you know you were a leader? Well, let me just say, I don't know that there's ever one moment that's an epiphany, right? Leadership's like everything else. It's like every talent. It, it evolves, you know? And it, that does happen to be my gift. But the first time I remember sort of rising above myself, throwing myself into a situation where I could have stayed quiet, frankly, was uh, when I was seven years old and I was walking home from school and we had a neighborhood bully, his name was Bobby, and, uh, and, and he rode up on his bike and I was with my friend Dawn, and Dawn was, you know, we were seven, but Dawn was of a stature, she looked like she was about five. And, um, and so Bobby, of course, being Bobby, was pushed Dawn down as hard as he could. And so I had this green book bag, my mom had made me out of felt, she had put on felt a little frog on it so it looked like Kermit the Frog, you know. And, and so I took my Kermit the Frog book bag, and I, I walked the heck out of Bobby. <laughs> and here I was, a shy kid. I didn't say two words to anybody. My mother couldn't believe it when Miss Palinol called her to tell her I hit Bobby with my book bag. She, she couldn't believe it. But I had. And you know what? I got in trouble. I had to apologize to Bobby. Not the violence part of it, but the justified righteousness part of it felt good. I have to say that. I learned a lesson as a young person. Maybe the book bag swinging wasn't necessary, but, but it felt good. The, 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 the righteousness of it, the justice of it, the, the forcing somebody to have respect for others, that was my first taste of what it was like to be a leader. And it was, the juice was worth the squeeze, you know? <laughs> Jeanette Hobbs. Oh, hi, Miss Hobbs. How you doing? She said, um, 
I got something I need you to do for me. What's that? And she said, well, she said, I don't know if you know this, but the neighborhood we live in, now, the neighborhood my husband and I live in, Miss Hollis lives in, they're at the corner of Brown Avenue and Buena Vista Road, just south of Buena Vista Road, back behind, back behind the Aflac Tower. And so she said, uh, I don't know if you know this, but, but the land that our neighborhood sits on was my ancestral farm, my, my family's farm. We worked this farm, and when I was a little girl, I remember my father. I looked out the back window of the house, and I remember my father with, a, with an open wagon and a bunch of oak trees and a couple of men, and they were planting the oak trees that lined the street of our neighborhood one by one. Those oak trees were planted by my father. And she said, well, the city wants to put a 10-lane road through our neighborhood, and I want you to stop them. <laughs> I ain't got time for this, Miss Hollis. <laughs> I mean, seriously. I don't know anything about transportation law. I don't know anything about the city. I don't know anything about the state. I don't know anything about the federal government. I, all I know is this case I'm working on. <laughs> and I know I'm behind and over my head. That's what I know. <laughs> say no to Miss Hollis. So I said, okay, I'd check on it. So I went home that night about 9 o'clock and I thought, and I hate to admit this, it's a little bit of a confession, Pastor A, a little bit of a confession, so I know what I'm going to do. So that next morning I went down to the city, went down to the engineering office here, and a gentleman walked out, he's no longer with the city, by the way, I just want to point that out before I tell the story. So this gentleman walks out, and I, I said, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I said, I'm here to ask about the widening of Buena Vista Road, putting it through that neighborhood. I said, now I know you've probably done all you need to do, and I am sure that that road project is warranted. And I am sure you have taken in all the information you need to take in to know that this thing needs to be done. And I am sure that this, there's no stopping it now, so there's no need for me to be asking questions about it. Isn't that right? And he said to me, I don't think you should be here asking these questions. Who do you think you are? Maybe you should just go on back to your office. I thought, what? Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> it's like, this is the most fascinating, inter interesting road project in my life right now. And I had a burning desire to figure out what in the world was going on with being a Mr. Road. And when I found out, because I went back to the office, put aside all my other work, started becoming an expert in federal transportation law, by the way, and I figured out that any citizen can apply to the federal government to become a stakeholder to get the whole file. Whole file. So I did it. I got that whole file. It was thousands of pages. That's okay. I read every single page. And I realized this, that a lot of good folk that had a lot of good thoughts believed that something else was going to happen on the east side of the city. And they believed that when that something else was going to happen on the east side of the city, they were going to build a big old 10-lane road. That was about 30 years ago. And of course that never happened, but that's okay. They were still going to spend $55 million to build a road with something that never happened. Right through a neighborhood that was still there. And they really changed. And they, they, they hadn't changed with it. So through a lot of hard work and a lot of people getting together, organization through our community, we stopped that road project. We stopped that road project. And you all are going to see now that when we put that bridge over the spider web down at, at Buena Vista and, and St. Mary's and where uh, you know, the spider web is and the, and, and the railroad tracks there, that that, that project is going to come back up Buena Vista Road a couple of months. Buena Vista Road is going to be one of the most beautiful streetscapes we have in this city. Because we were able to stop that road project that didn't belong and was ill-advised. We were able to stop it through community and through leadership. And so at that time and in that moment, God had a plan for me to use my talents and skills that he gave me to improve and prosper a neighborhood and give an old woman peace and justice. And I prospered through that. I prospered through that, through the satisfaction of pleasing a person in need. 
you know, the way that feels through helping save my neighborhood. It would have impacted me, obviously. And through building community. So if I had had my wish, that would have been my plan for me. My plan would have been that that gentleman would have said, I'm sure we've done everything just right. I would have gone right on back to my office, I hate to admit. But God had him say something quite different. And it revealed an opportunity to serve. An opportunity to serve. And so, as we say, one of the gentlemen that came up a little bit earlier was talking about how we're benefited from our connectedness. That Jesus, just as each of us has one body with many members, and these parts do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. That's our gospel. That's our prosperity. And so this isn't about me. It's not about any one of you. It's about God's children. And his plan for all of us, our human community. Judy mentioned in her, uh, in, in her introduction that um, one of the saddest days she ever saw me was on the day that they announced my college alma mater was going to close. And it was back in 2015, March 3rd, 2015 to be exact. And I had won re-election, and we had so much to do in the city. We had so much to do. We had, we had been suffering, frankly, because the recession, we couldn't shake it. We couldn't shake this recession. And then just about the time we thought that we might be coming out of it, we might be able to do some things. They had the drawdown in the Middle East. And it affected Fort Benning. And so Fort Benning had really shut down some of their growth and activity and that affected us economically. And then they had the sequester in Washington, D.C., where they were holding back some funds for uh, military installations. And that was impacting our community, our, our economy, negatively. And so the city was taking in less and less and less money every year, even though we should have otherwise been out of the recession. So we were looking at laying off 100, 125 people, I mean, good people, people with families, you know, the kinds of things that keep a mayor, city manager, and other leaders awake at night. And, and in this particular time, we also had, as you all have read, we've been sued by some of our elected officials. So we had elected officials suing elected officials. Well, all y'all out there are thinking, why can't these people get it together? Right? You're like, what? You know? And, 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 and the state's looking at us going, what's going on in Columbus, Georgia? You know, it's an embarrassment. Now, I knew that the litigation was going to be resolved. I, I, being a lawyer, I'd read the law, I'd read the facts, I knew the case was going to be thrown out, and ultimately was. But that was no solace, because the wheels of justice grind slowly, folks. We were looking at years, I knew that. So, so on top of all these other things I was talking about, and I've been talking about, I was trying to keep a lid on it, you know, trying to keep a lid on your faith in your government, your faith in your elected officials. So, so I set up a meeting on March 3rd, and, and I had uh, a bunch of people coming in, and we were going to try to resolve this thing, try to stop it before it really got started, you know, and that was a Tuesday, and, and uh, I, I had woken up on Monday, and I didn't feel right. But that's okay, you push it through. I woke up on Tuesday morning and I was sick. I mean, dog sick. But I had pulled all these people together. It had taken months to get everybody together for this meeting. And it was one shot I thought we had to try and circumvent the path that was inevitably in front of us. We couldn't get it together. So I had to meet that meeting. So I drove myself in there at 9 o'clock, about 12.30, we break. No, no miracles, no instant solutions, maybe some progress, but, but no clear answers. And so we break, and Lacey Morrison in our office comes up to me and says, Mayor, there's a reporter on line one, and she wants to know if you have a comment about Sweetbriar College closing. Let me tell you a little bit about Sweetbriar College. If there's anybody here that went to an HBCU, one of the reasons I support HBCU so much is because I went to a small college, a small college that was women only, just like Spelman, and, and, and they nurture you, and, and they give you a voice, and, and they 
and, and they show you what's possible. You don't get lost in the crowd of 65,000 people at these other wonderful institutions. You know, Sweetbriar College made me the woman I am. Just like the HBCUs made you the person you are. And, and just like my church, Tripp and I tied to Sweetbriar on the hope that other young women had the opportunity. My parents couldn't have paid that bill. They, it, they, I was able to go through the generosity of others before me just like with you all and just like with HBCUs. And that's why Tripp and I support UNC so much. And so when I heard that, I was already sick. <laughs> you know, I was already laden with these issues of being a leader, the ones that I hope you didn't know about or fully appreciate. I hope you only saw the mountaintops because that's a signature of being a good leader that you were sleeping well not knowing that underneath that mountaintop was a big old 10,000 foot mountain, but that's okay, we got it covered. But, but that's where we were and they came up to me and said, close your college. So I went in and I talked to the reporter and I gave the kind of Quotes that you give when you're used to talking to the media, it was, it was fine. And, um, and so I called my sister and I said, Tanya, you better tell mom this is going to be national news because Sweetbriar College had been around for well over 100 years. I mean, women from all over the country, it was, it was a significant school to close, like, like Spelman would be. And, um, and so I, I said, Sweetbriar College is going to close, you better go tell mom before she hears it on the news. And my sister said, whoo, boy, I bet they're sorry they asked you to be their graduation speaker this year. And I was like, hmm, I'd forgotten. They had asked me to be the graduation speaker in 2014, but I was running for re-election. And so my election was on May 22nd, 2014, and Sweetbriar's graduation was on May 20th. 2014. I couldn't be in Virginia when I'm sitting here for re-election. So I said, I can't be your graduation speaker. And they said, well, will you be our graduation speaker in 2015? And I said, sure. Back in 2014. I didn't know they were going to close. In fact, we didn't know they were going to close because as Judy said, Tripp and I don't have any children. That's why we give back. We want, we want our, our gifting, our service to be our legacy. That's, that's what God planned for us. And so we had just days before March 3rd signed a will that left almost our entire estate to Sweetbriar College. And they took that letter and they took that copy of our will and they headed back to Virginia and 12 days later they closed the college. So you can imagine what that speech was going to be. I was going to light that place on fire. <laughs> God had a plan for me. He said, I know you're busy. I know you're trying to keep this city from bankruptcy. I know you're trying to save 125 jobs. I know you're trying to save the citizens from thinking that y'all are crazy down there because you're suing each other. I know. You want to take the time to save this city from the embarrassment of long, protracted lawsuit. But by God, I got a college that you need to join up with a couple thousand women and go save in the state of Virginia. That was God's plan for me. Not my plan. Not my plan. But I'm telling you what, it was the most rewarding thing I've ever been a part of in such a short period of time. We raised... $28.5 million in seven days. We turned $12 million of that into cash because we needed cash for the settlement of the lawsuit that was pending in Virginia. And we did that in a little over 40 days. It was a miracle. I was on the phone. Judy can tell you. I come in. I have meetings. I break for a few minutes. I run to my office. Sarah, Teresa Tomlinson here. Look, we're going to need some money. <clears throat> I'm going to need about a whole lot of money. Uh, how much in for? In our school spare time. And there were women doing that all over this country because it was something worth saving. And so what the Lord tells us is we rejoice in our suffering and in our trials and tribulations because we don't know why they've been served up for us. But we know this, that if we get through it, it's the perseverance. It's the perseverance that's our reward. It's the character that comes from the perseverance 
that's our reward, and it's the hope that comes from the character that's our reward. That's our prosperity. That's our prosperity. It didn't benefit me. I didn't get a check. I didn't get a boat. I didn't get a piece of pocket from helping to save sweetheart. But I got that community. I got to be part of that legacy that we saved together. A legacy that hopefully 10 generations from now, kids will be benefiting from and not really appreciating how it is they got there. That's the luxury of, of, of doing great things is that people don't appreciate it. But, but the perseverance, the character, the hope, those are our gifts. That's, that's what God plans for us. Those are the true and valuable gifts. So God says in Jeremiah, basically, Honey, it ain't about you. You are my vessel. I have provided you with talents of leadership and problem solving, and I intend to use you. To my end, to prosper others, and in that, you will glean perseverance, character, and hope. You will get part of this human community, and you will get to know the rush of justice and peace. Mm. Sweeper Our College thrives today. It is brand new, brand new students, professors, support staff, saving those hundreds of jobs, and women are being educated there today because God had a different plan. He didn't want me to be a ballerina. <laughs> he didn't want me to stew too hard on all those other troubles we had, and we were able to overcome those things, as you know, and read about along the way. But God had another plan. So I'm going to close with this because it's important to talk about where we are and not just our community, but our state and our nation today. You know, I, I think about this country and I think about the long, dark exile we're walking through currently. I pray for relief that we be delivered from the exile of hate and division, and racism, yeah. and intolerance, yeah. we all pray that we be able to have our political ideals prosper, and that the man or the woman that we want to be in office will win, but Jeremiah teaches us that that's not exactly the way it works. Jeremiah teaches us that we will be delivered from political and moral exile, when we seek peace and prosperity of the whole, when we ensure every man and every woman's voice is heard, when it is as easy to vote for one person as it is to vote for another, when no one is given the pink voting ballots of yesterday in the form of a provisional ballot today, with no person is yanked off a bus because they're headed to the polls and somebody thinks that the color of their skin suggests how they might vote. If we work to eliminate suppression and the absence of justice, we will ensure the peace and prosperity the Lord requires. When we allow ourselves to be used as vessels of God's plan of justice, our exile will end. So we got some work to do. We got to stop just praying for deliverance from the untruths and the hatred of those in some of the highest elected and appointed offices. To quote a great local pastor, we have to pray. Like it all depends on God. But we got to work like it all depends on us. That's what God expects. Not that he will deliver us without us first working to secure his plan for us and the plan for his people. God has work for us to do. And he's not in the business of granting wishes. Jeremiah 29.11 is fitting for 
where we are. It's not that we escape our trials and tribulations that matter, but that we learn to thrive and persevere in the midst of them. That we see them as opportunities to better our community and to better ourselves as soldiers for peace and prosperity. Like the Israelites, we will seek peace and prosperity for our city, for our nation, and for our politics. And we will pray to the Lord for our community and for mankind to prosper too. And I want to close out today by thanking you all. It has been a beautiful eight years. You all, I have seen you in the trenches with me. I thank God for you. Thank you so very much. Thank you.